One of the most important performance aspects of any inverter is the quality of the output waveform it produces. If you're watching this video, you've probably heard of sine wave inverters and modified sine wave inverters. I just wanted to quick go over, uh, over the differences between these units. Um, first of all, uh, AC power out of your wall socket, as most people probably know, is, uh, is a sine wave or cosine wave or whatever you want to call it. But uh, oops, there's a hole there. But in general, uh, a sine wave output like this. Um, it's 120 volts here in North America, maybe another voltage elsewhere. But uh, these tick lines on here are approximately 170 volts, peak to peak, from peak to trough. And uh, the RMS voltage, root mean squared, um, which I won't go into, is then uh, 120 volts, somewhere, somewhere around this level. Meaning that uh, if you put 120 volts of a DC voltage through a purely resistive load, you get the same amount of power output as putting this sine wave into that same DC load. Because during this portion of the wave, you're getting a lot less power out of it because it's less than 120 volts. During this portion of the wave, you're getting more power out of it. So it ends up being around 170 volts. In any case, this is a, a sine wave, like you would get out of the wall socket. And uh, there's three primary types of waveforms that uh, inverters can produce. Uh, one is a simple square wave. You almost never see that, so I'm not going to cover it here. Uh, typically, you will get a modified sine wave, they call it. So calling it a modified sine wave is kind of lying. It's not really a sine wave at all. Um, or a true sine wave inverter, which also is never truly a sine wave. It's always some sort of approximate sine wave, but they can be very close. Um, in my particular unit here, the uh, one that I'm showing this time, this is a sine wave inverter. My previous convert, UPS, which I made a video on, is a modified sine wave inverter. So the modified sine wave inverter produces a waveform that looks something like this. Something like that. And if you really use your imagination, you can kind of imagine what a sine wave would look like compared to this. And uh, it's a, a very rough approximation to a sine wave. And uh, there's a few, few really uh, great benefits to an engineer that's designing a board like this. Uh, one being that this peak voltage here and here is generally proportional to your battery voltage and inversely proportional to your load because there's copper losses and other losses inside the unit. So what they can actually do is take these, these peaks and troughs and uh, widen them or shrink them the appropriate amount to get the, uh, the correct output RMS voltage. So when your battery is at a really high voltage and your load's really small, your output waveform may look like this. If your battery voltage is low and or your uh, load is very heavy, uh, at the worst case, your output could look like this. Which is simply a square wave going to 120 volts positive and negative. Um, in either case, this is not a sine wave, nor is this. Somewhere in between is your best approximation, but it's never a very good one. And there's definite drawbacks to that approach. Very simple, very cheap, but not very good. And uh, I'll do a little demonstration of, uh, of what this kind of wave will, uh, will do to some uh, uh, motors. It also has negative effects on many other things. These uh, sharp edges create a lot of high harmonics. Things like uh, sensitive electronics won't operate very nicely out of them. <clears throat> this peak voltage often changes. Here it's 120 volts. Here it could be a couple hundred volts. That can be really bad for things as well. So they have their limitations. For some things, they're just fine. And for other things, you really don't want to use them. A modified sine wave inverter is cheap and easy to make, but uh, it's not really all that good. So the expensive units are what they call sine wave, um, but they're never truly sine wave. They're always an approximation of a sine wave. Uh, the uh, closeness of that approximation to a true sine wave relates to the quality of the unit. Some of them are less sine wave than they are a uh, trapezoid wave, especially when you get under load. Um, some of them will call that a sine wave. Clearly it's not, yet it's better than a square wave. Other ones are uh, our true sine wave under 
approximately true sine wave under low load, but once you put them under a, a, a large load up near their maximum ability, a lot of times they'll end up being uh, a sine wave with a clipped top and bottom. If I can draw this. And uh, that's also not a sine wave, but it's pretty close and that'll run most things pretty well. Um, the best units are always always a very good approximation of a sine wave. And uh, that depends a lot on how much you want to spend on your unit and how well it's designed. Um, so I'm just going to cover one way that you can make a sine wave. There's multiple ways to do this. Um, this is just one of the ways. Uh, most likely that's the way that this unit works. I'm not going to actually uh, dissect it and figure it out because it doesn't matter, but uh, this is most likely how it operates. So inside there are two reference signals, one of them being a sine wave, surprise, surprise, and the sine wave is uh, probably 5 volts in this unit. It might be 3.3 in other units. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but uh, it's just a reference voltage. <clears throat> and it's a sine wave, maybe made by a quartz oscillator, maybe made by a ceramic resonator, uh, maybe something else, but a 60 hertz sine wave at a very low voltage that logic can handle. It then uh, also produces a much higher frequency, maybe uh, if this is 60 hertz, maybe it'll make a 60 kilohertz triangle wave. Some sort of sawtooth. Could be a triangle, could be a sawtooth, either polarity. Uh, it doesn't doesn't make a huge difference. Um, there's definitely design trade-offs there, but the frequency of this uh, waveform and many other other factors inside the unit are, are a trade-off between the quality of your output waveform, higher frequency means better quality, the, uh, the place where you want to spend your money on filtering or on the control of this loop, um, the cost of the unit, the efficiency of the unit, all of those things. So this is 60 Hertz, what is called the 60 kilohertz, and uh, these two are then superimposed on each other. And both of these signals are then run into uh, a comparator. So this one might go into the positive, this one might go into the negative. It's not that important, but uh, <clears throat> one gets fed into one side, one into the other. And uh, basically, whenever one is uh, greater than the other, this would be a one. Whenever it's lesser, this would be a zero. And uh, then there's also feedbacks from the actual output line voltage back into this to uh, adjust the height of these waveforms <clears throat> um, so that you can increase or decrease uh, duty cycles to compensate for other losses in your system, but that's really beyond the scope of this. Uh, just to give a general idea, it goes through a comparator, outputs a 1 and a 0, so let me draw something else here that probably makes the operation a little bit clearer. So we'll just draw a, a big sine wave here. This is supposed to be centered about 0. <clears throat> So you have your sine wave here at 60 hertz, and you have this triangle wave that's a much higher frequency in here, and uh, a comparator with an output. So what this output looks like, if we take a little tiny segment right around zero volts here, the comparator output is actually going to look like this. <clears throat> a 50% duty square wave. And if you filter this through a uh, a low enough, uh, a low pass filter, you end up with a DC voltage of zero volts. Because it's half the time it's positive, half the time it's negative, it averages out to zero. And that's what this voltage here is. It's about zero volts. If we take a little tiny segment here and blow it up, what you'll end up with is a waveform that looks like this. And this is centered about uh, centered about zero. In this case, it's on far more than it's off. So if you average this out, it ends up being a very high voltage. We're up here. If you take a little tiny segment down here at the bottom, you end up with something that, uh, that looks like this. Just basically turn that one upside down. It's negative far more than it is positive, so you have a, a high negative voltage. And it just does this very rapidly. Um, like I said, this is probably 60 kilohertz or something. And uh, the duty cycles increase and decrease along with this waveform. 
and you end up with uh, an approximate sine wave. Of course, you have to filter this, and uh, in this particular design, they filter it through a very large inductor choke. That's the transformer. Conveniently, it's in this unit, so they just use that to filter it. And you get uh, an approximate sine, sine wave out of it. Uh, there's things that uh, affect the quality of this sine wave, one of them being uh, voltage drop due to losses in the transistors and the wiring in the transformer itself. If you get too much voltage drop, you'll end up with flat spots on here. So I'm going to try to eliminate some of those by upgrading the FETs. And uh, also just the control circuitry, how this looks. Uh, there may be slope compensation and such to uh, compensate under heavy loads. Maybe instead of a sine wave, they'll increase the slope of this to make it uh, more positive and more negative more often. I'm not sure how they do that, but uh, we're going to take a look at that part next. Um, I just watched the, uh, the clip that I just recorded on output waveforms, and uh, I discovered that uh, it's not really a very good explanation. I think I'll include it anyway, but if you, have, uh, if you want a better explanation, just go to Wikipedia and look it up. Um, it's not a very in-depth explanation there, I'm sure. It never is, but it uh, probably is easier to understand than what I was going through. I may not always be the best teacher. So, in any case, what are we looking at here, and why is this important to inverters? Um, I realized that I left uh, one thing off. Um, I always kept saying that the uh, sine wave inverters are never truly sine wave. They're always an approximation, and uh, I never really explained how you get a true sine wave. Well, you get a true sine wave much the way that the power plants uh, make a true sine wave on the grid. You actually use a rotating machine. So in this case, these are both standard electric motors, but uh, let's just pretend that this one is a DC motor that runs off of a 24 volt battery, and this one over here is an AC motor, a synchronous machine, preferably. So we take this one and plug it into our battery, spins around, turns that motor, and this one will make uh, AC power. Um, and that's how you make a true sine wave. In this case, we're not using rotating machines like this. We're just using uh, digital logic. Digital logic is always one and zero, so it's never going to be a true sine wave, but we can get a pretty close approximation that's good enough. Um, I just wanted to quick show this, and uh, if you want very high quality power, if you want to convert between single phase and three phase, if you want laboratory quality power, this is how they do it. They have a motor and another motor. They can convert between 50 hertz and 60 hertz. They can convert between AC and DC. They can do all kinds of stuff. They can filter um, this way, but this is how you get very clean, good quality power. Obviously not with these crappy old motors, but with uh, this sort of principle. That's the old school analog way of converting between different phases and frequencies. There are, are digital solutions to it too. This is uh, just happens to be a power source from Agilent. Um, this is especially popular in, in lower wattage units, uh, below 10 kilowatts typically. But uh, these are nice because they're programmable. You can uh, program the frequency and uh, the voltage and among other things. But uh, now that power electronics are, are less expensive than they used to be, this is increasingly used in, in laboratories. But even if I take this one and scroll down to the data sheet, uh, even here, this one is rated for 1% total harmonic distortion. So even this one has a good amount of distortion in it. Um, and this is an example of what a distorted sine wave may look like if I had a better a better oscilloscope to show you, my unit would probably look a lot like this too. Maybe not quite this clean, but similar to this. And uh, it's not a clean sine wave, there's a lot of switching noise on it. You can run this through some other expensive filtering and such to get that uh, a little bit cleaner, but... I just wanted to bring up that there's there are digital solutions for this, and they're increasingly popular. Most modern labs will have units like this rather than the rotating machines. Um, I've been to uh, places that use either.